Hello and welcome to another episode of the Training Tidbits podcast show. I'm your host Ryan Cartledge from Animal Training Academy and as always I am really excited to be back in your eardrums today as we get ready to talk all about best practice animal behaviour, training and management. Of course we have another animal behaviour extraordinaire joining us on the show today to talk about her experiences, share stories, entertain, educate and inspire you. Today we're travelling to Phoenix, Arizona to talk to Hilda Tree the Behavioural Enrichment and International Animal Welfare Coordinator at Phoenix Zoo and mentor for the Jane Goodall Institute. Hilda was born and raised in Budapest until 1989 when she moved to the United States. She began working as a zookeeper immediately after graduating from high school and over the last 28 years she has honed her skills as a caregiver, enrichment specialist, trainer, educator and behavioural manager of a huge array of species with an additional special focus on chimpanzees. On top of this, Hilda additionally holds a triple major degree in biology, geography and education. She uses her education and experience to help change the lives of animals, the people that work with them and the organisations that house them. As mentioned, her current role is the Behavioural Enrichment and International Animal Welfare Coordinator at the Phoenix Zoo, as well as being a mentor for the Jane Goodall Institute. She's worked with numerous Numerous international zoos in India, Israel, Qatar, Egypt, the UAE, Mexico, Paraguay, Argentina, Chile, China, and other countries, and is especially skilled in helping these organizations create productive, healthy, mentally stimulating conditions for their animals with little to no funding. Internationally, Hilda's policy is to leave no chimp isolated, no elephant chained, or no tiger malnourished. She embraces those who may not know and teaches them that they are the voices for those that cannot speak, the guardians for those that cannot step away, and the saviors for those who cannot save themselves. It is without further ado, and with very great pleasure, I welcome one Hilda Therese to the show today. Hello, Hilda. Hello. Thank you so much for having me on your show. I appreciate it. Oh, it's a great pleasure to have you here today, Hilda. So thank you very much for coming on the show. Hey, we're going to dive straight in today with our first question, and we're going to talk about something that I can't wait to learn more about. And it's actually the reason I got in touch with you in the first place after reading about Phoenix Zoo's zoo-wide contra-freeloading strategy in the World Association of Zoos and Aquariums Welfare Strategy. Hilda, can you start off by explaining to everyone out there what contra-freeloading is? Well, the term itself is contra means again, freeloading means free feeding and the idea comes from that at some point about 10 12 years ago we decided that it's not enough to give our animals some food in a dish and have them eat for a short time and then just stand on exhibit all day long so we wanted to have them experience more natural behaviors more of their species appropriate behaviors and one of them is the most species typical behavior in the wild is for Foraging. And what the zoos usually do is they make their animals and they put them on feeding schedules. And our idea was is to have our animals forage very similarly to the wild. And foraging is not eating. Foraging is a very complex behavior, including the animal has to search for its food and somehow get to its food, then eat it and digest it. And so this is a very complex behavior. And then out of this whole thing, the animals mostly what they get is the eating and the digesting in captivity so we decided that we would like to pay attention to actually make our animals look for their food longer such as hiding their food everywhere mostly in substrate or in on exhibit in the furniture or get to them in a more difficult way such as puzzle feeders so it took a long time for us we started out with our elephants because we wanted to teach our elephants to let them be elephants. That was one of our program actually, it called Let Them Be Elephants. When we wanted our elephants to go on exhibit and immediately look for puzzle feeders or hide hidden places when they can find their food. So they would spend a long time of searching for their food or to acquire their food. And then when we finished that, we went to primates, of course, and then carnivores and all the other larger taxa until we finished and almost every single species in the Phoenix Zoo right now is uh, working for their food one way or another. Not every day, not all the time, but we do our 
our very best to encourage it. Now you have to be very careful with making animals work for their food. You know, you can't always have all the animals do it. You will always have animals who are geriatric and it's hard for them or have physical abilities, like maybe they have three legs and it's not so easy to manipulate an item or different kind of sicknesses, obviously. No teeth and many more things. But in general, if an animal is happy and healthy, we try to make them work for their food. People don't realize that animals, even if free food is available at the same time, actually do prefer to work for their own food. There are a lot of scientific studies out there on the internet. People can look it up. My favorite was from Forks. He had uh, some Mongolian gerbils and he offered 1,000 sunflower seeds freely and 30 sunflower seeds uh, in a sandbox. And 67% of the gerbils were actually digging for their food because what they prefer is to find it their way, the natural way because what the gerbil do is they dig. You can do a lot with this program besides having mentally healthy, very busy animals on exhibit. I never forget when a keeper actually complained to me a long, long time ago that her chickens wasn't eating. It was like 110 degrees in, in our zoo and they didn't touch their diet. And then I said, well, let me just grab some hay. And she says, hay for what? And I'm like, just watch. And I throw the hay on the ground and I pour the same diet into the hay. Immediately, the rooster went there and started to look and then called the hens and started to scratch. And then he found and then he kept scratching because he kept finding. And this is an innate behavior that ground birds have, obviously, for I don't know how many years during the evolution when chicken has to scratch and then they will find their food. They can't help it. And they will do this until around midday when they very tired and their belly is full and they dig a small hole in the ground for temperature decrease and then they go to sleep. So besides the fact that now that animal was eating its diet, even if it didn't want to previously, we can also imply this to other situations. Like for example, if an animal doesn't want to eat its medicine, we do know that a lot of animals recognize if, for example, uh, you have a medicine in a piece of grape and they know that when you hand it over, it has something in it and it's suspicious already. Yet, I am wondering if you would, you know, make them contra field for it and just hide it in the substrate or together with the food whether they will eat it because just as the way the same way as they were eating the diet they didn't touch a minute ago so it has a lot of use but basically the whole idea about this is to teach animals to work for their food to have exhibiting species typical actually in zoos in species appropriate behaviors and keeping them busy 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 thanks so much for that Hilda and that's so fascinating I'm always sitting here not nodding my head <laughs> going <laughs> how, how great is this information all these questions coming in my mind I've made a page of notes after listening to you Justin so I just wanted to dive a little bit deeper if that's okay in a previous conversation you and I had we talked about the foraging that you set up for the elephants and yep. you talked about this program I love the name of it let them be elephants can you maybe tell us about your experiences there yes we have three female elephants who not necessarily get along very well so we wanted to take their mind off of being aggressive and negative. And we brought in a world famous consultant, Ellen Rucroft, who suggested that we need to turn their behaviors back to the original behaviors, meaning let them be elephants. Female elephants, as far as I know, do not fight in the wild, only males. So it's not natural in captivity for female elephants to fight. So what we had to do is to turn their mind back to the original purpose of what they should do during the daytime, which is looking for food and eat because what do elephant do? As I always say, elephant eats, elephant walks, elephant eats, elephant walks. These are the two main behaviors that you need to consider at first. But of course, then you consider many, many more skin care and training and etc. But this is the two main behaviors. So when you look at the Phoenix Zoo's elephant exhibit, it's not a huge, luxurious green park, what people might want to see. And that's just my opinion. I'm not even sure if always 
that's the best way to go. If you look at the Phoenix Zoo's elephant exhibit, every single thing in there has its purpose, to keep our animals busy all day long and to elicit species-appropriate behaviors. And that's the whole idea. That's the goal to do it. When you look at the exhibit, it's full of puzzle feeders that are hung high above. So we can work the elephant's trunk and neck muscle and shoulder, and they would, you know, have a different set of skills to forage from above. But then on the same time, you are going to have a lot of feeders on the ground, again, having a different set of skills to manipulate the feeding devices, rolling it, kicking it, hitting it, whichever way they want to. We do have enormous amount of logs, huge palm trees and other logs across the exhibit, forcing our elephants to actually go around or even better to step it over. When you have elderly elephants who has to have exercise all the time, the very simple way to force them practically to exercise is to have them stepping over things over and over and over. So this is a type of exercise. Not to mention that the keepers lowering the feeders, like, I don't know, maybe 10 different kind of feeders are on exhibit. Not every one of them has food. Even if it has food, it might not be reachable. Or the keepers are telling the elephants to, okay, this is not, I'm going to take this feeder up, I'm going to lower that one. And we're making our elephants going from A to B, constantly figuring out which feeder has food, which feeder they have access to, even if it has food. So these are, you know, our elephant keepers are extremely dedicated, all of our keepers. But what I'm saying is that the functional part, I think for me, is the most important keyword. Not so much how beautiful your exhibit looks like, because you can put your animal into the most beautiful exhibit and could have stereotypic behaviors. The zoo's goal is that we are keeping our animals healthy, mentally and physically and busy as much as we possibly can. Such great information and there's going to be zookeepers listening to this. I know thinking deeply about their daily activities and, and how they could potentially set their exhibits up better. There's also people listening to the podcast, Hilda, whose exhibits are their houses with their pets at home. Can you just briefly talk about the importance of not only potentially applying this to elephants and zoos, but also your dogs and cats and parrots and pets at home? The first thing, when I was teaching uh, classes for how to keep your pets at home to the general public, I tried to imply the same thing. First of all, look at your animal, read up on it. Don't just keep it, read up on it. Very, very important. And see which one is the first couple main behaviors that you think it implies to your animal. You have to pay attention to that, you know. A dog and a cat is very different from a rabbit. You know, a dog and a cat is practically hunt very fast. So it's searching for its food for, for a long time, but it gets to its food very fast, eats very fast, and then rests for a long, long time. That's extremely different from a parrot and a rabbit who is spending the entire day practically foraging, looking for food and eating continuously. So for your dogs and cats, I wouldn't just put um, their food into their dish every day, I would get a simple uh, Coke bottle, put some hose on it, put the chai in there, let them roll it. You know, very simple idea, but they can fit all fuddle around with it as long as they can. And um, if it's a cat, keep it in mind that usually cats like to reach from sideways or from the above, but mostly from sideways. So if you get a cereal box, I would put the holes on it if you want them to reach inside and get the food out from the sides. It's different from dogs. It's just in every single way, just practically figuring out how can you keep your animal entertained and look for its food all the time and how to get to its food in a more difficult way. You know, for example, birds, when you have seed eating birds, how easy is that to use your paper towel rolls at home and put the food in there and let them, you know, rip the paper towel around it apart or just simply have a pine cone and you will use the flour water paste you used in childhood when you were making paper mache roll the pine cone in there, roll the seeds in there, hang it up and have them forage from there. It's much more difficult for them because every time they pack at it, the pine cone, since it's hung, moves in every kind of directions and it's bouncing to every kind of directions. So it's more difficult for the birds to get their diet from it. So it's just a little bit of a creativity from pet owners part to figure out how their animals mind work. Just a little bit of reading about it really to what they do, what their main behavior 
behaviors are and just try to figure out what to do with it. And then, and I suggest to every pet owner, don't try to buy any kind of very expensive toys and feeder devices. All my friends and colleagues and I, we just laugh all the time that we, we bought the most expensive things and my dog could care less and it wanted to have the paper towel roll or the empty Coke bottle. And it was just so much more interesting than any kind of expensive toys. So it's not about how expensive it is, how creative you are. Love it. And so important. Thanks so much for sharing the information, Hilda. I just know everyone out there listening is going to be taking so much away from this. Hey, to move on to the next question, the next thing that you highlighted to me that you wanted to talk about was substrate use. Did you want to talk about the importance of substrate? So when I'm going to developing countries most of the time, but not just in developing countries, but more likely in developing countries, I found animals kept in empty cages. It's nothing else but an empty concrete cage or any kind of hard surface like a cage with tiles on the bottom, wooden surface on the bottom, anything that is hard. There is nothing worse for an animal than having on hard surface. That is an unyielding surface which the animal cannot do anything with. You can't make a nest, you can't dig a hole in it for a den, and it is extremely hard on their paws. They get all kind of wounds on there and, and infections in their paws and in their feet. Now, if you have the concrete, that's even worse than possibly anything else. That's just my opinion. So I don't know if everybody agrees with me, but this is my opinion especially the wet, cold concrete that animals are kept on. It's um, extremely hard on their health from every situation besides getting cold and any kind of sicknesses, you know, on their paws. So one of my presentation usually when I go to countries is to how to use substrate and how simple is that when you do it. All you need is a bale of hay. All you need is a bale of straw and you can completely change your animal's life within that empty cage because if you imagine a cage on concrete with a bar and an animal sitting in it and has nothing to do. First of all, it's spending the whole day walking around uh, because it has nothing to do. A lot of times stereotypic behaviors are coming out as well. And then it's walking in its own fecal and urine, very dirty all the time, not hygienic at, at all whatsoever. You put some straw in there or hay in there, that's already covering the, the surface immediately and will pick up the urine and the feces and the animal is most of the time clean. It's a very soft surface. I love it when I first time give it to animals and just watch them somersaulting in it and throwing it on the top of their head and just playing and just enjoying the fact that they have this surface what now they can manipulate and do whatever they want to do with building a nest or just um, throwing it at each other just for playtime. But it's also extremely important because that could be your best friend when you want to do contra freeloading. You know, instead of having a, an empty concrete cage, if you chop up the diet and you put it into the uh, bale of hay, now they can look for their food. Now they cannot pick it up as fast as before. I remember a long time ago when our hummer dryers baboons, it was like 20 years ago, we had the concrete night house, just like, you know, everybody else. And then we put a cup of uh, Milo, a type of seed on the, we just throw it on the ground. And then the Hamadryas baboons went with their arms and basically swept all of the seeds as fast as they can into a bunch of, uh, you know, bigger piles and they just licked it up. So it backfired because they weren't foraging the seeds as low as we wanted to. It was really fast. Now, if you throw a bale of hay on the top of it and you put, he, he hide the Milo, a cup of Milo in it, now nah, the animal has a real problem. Now it will take time to try to find the seeds in that. So here you are again having an animal spending hours and hours and hours foraging as opposed to licking up the seed in 10 minutes and sitting, not doing anything. So substrate is extremely important because you can encourage foraging, because you can keep the animals in the right way, because they can manipulate it and it's um, hygienic. I don't even know. It's just your best friend. That's all I can say. And it's also cheap, isn't it? Compared yes, to the... yes. I mean, of course, I go to different kind of countries when, you know, maybe Bermuda hay is not available. So I won't suggest that you put off off hay in there because it's going to uh, make the animals scratch and it's um, very hard so they can poke the animals all the time as opposed to the soft grass hay. But then we use some um, shredded papers or you go and buy Excelsior, which is basically a wood shaving. You can also use just simple wood shaving. 
leaves. You can use the edible leafy trees when they have the dry leaves under them. You can just rake that up and put it in the cage. It's hilarious, actually, what animals can do because they're noisy, the leaves, <laughs> because they're dry leaves. So it's it's fantastic when they when they get into the humorous side and start to goofing around in the dry leaves. I had warthogs jumping up and down in it and was, I just left and left and left and the tigers and whatnot. So, you know, you don't have to buy anything. You can just be creative what's around you. Newspaper is a, is a good substrate too. If you have lots of newspaper, now you might not be able to use it in a couple of countries who has, um, you know, the ink is toxic. But if it's not, then go for it. Some people use coconut shaving. If you're creative, it's endless. <laughs> the possibility to what you can put in a cage and make an animal happy. Anything but the empty concrete cage with an unyielding surface. I love that. And one word that I really like is being creative. Yeah, our keepers are the best in the Phoenix Zoo. I mean, the way they create enrichment, sometimes I'm just wondering, how did they come up with it? Like if you have an animal like a rabbit whose cages wouldn't be the bigger or like a, a hamster or a guinea pig, things like that. They still can figure out tiny little puzzle feeders that they can work in the cage. Or one of the keepers discovered that you can buy woven like a mat, like what you would lose on the floor or woven Bermuda hay. So when you give that to the animal, it doesn't take up any kind of space because it's like a mat. But for the animal to take that apart and eat it takes much longer than free given hay. It has to work for it, you know. And for carnivorous birds, you know, raptors, they gave white mice in a pumpkin which has white seed. And then so the animals have to figure out which one is its food and which one is not because they're both white. And just, I, I don't even know. I can go on and on probably to what the keepers coming up with and how simple is that and this is what i like i really truly truly believe that simple is the best you don't have to come up with some kind of very expensive item to make your animal behave the right way uh, you can give a feather uh, to another bird i gave once to a waddled crane i gave an, an ostrich feather and then it was fantastic to see how it threw it up in the air and then it was jumping on it with its beak until it hit the ground then threw it up again in the air and was jumping on it again until it hit the ground and it played with that simple feather for like 10 minutes and it's just another feather or how you can give hoofstock urine to just even do basic training for example about 15 years ago when we wanted to have uh, urine taken from the mexican wolf and then so one of the keeper created a y-shaped metal piece and the end of it was a um, glass vial but you usually put your blood when they take your blood in the the blood places which I, I can't think of how you call those and then I just put a little drop of zebra urine above it and then of course the wolf's first behavior natural behavior was to go and mark it and the clear urine went down into the vial and here you go you have a clear urine sample for the veterinarian you didn't have to lock your animal inside for hours you didn't have to stand there wait until it pees you don't have to wonder if it's clear enough if the concrete was clean enough so simple it's a very good thing <laughs> Great lesson. And I'm just curious, just before we go on to the next question, I am conscious of time, but is there a specific strategy the keepers at Phoenix Zoo use to come up with creative ideas or do we just have an amazing crew of really creative people? Well, uh, when, when we have a new employee, I spend about an hour trying to do an orientation when I'm explaining them the contra freeloading program and uh, of course all the other enrichment types as well and I think after that they just usually free to use their minds and submit ideas after ideas after ideas and it comes with experience and see where your animal is and try to look into it a little bit more to where it could be and I suppose we just have an extremely good crew who really cares a lot and just wants to do more and more for the animals hey great thanks for sharing that information hilda we will move on next i was wondering if we could go over a couple of terms that we've already mentioned in the podcast today these terms are thrown around from time to time and you and i thought we would talk about the differences between them and discuss them in more detail these are species specific and species appropriate behaviors can you go over these two terms for us give us your definition and talk about their relevance when coming up with appropriate enrichment for your animals yes of course behavior in general 
just means, if I want to talk about loosely the terms, it just means what an animal does. Species typical behavior is what an animal does in the wild. Species appropriate behavior is what an animal is allowed to do in captivity. So obviously, when us keepers and, and people who are taking care of animals in captivity, we can't let our animals do whatever they want all the time. For example, infanticide. We can't let animals who in the wild uh, kill their offsprings or other animals' offsprings practice the same thing. I can't let chimpanzee kill colobus monkeys for fun because that's what it would eat in the wild as well and likes to hunt. Or, you know, we're not going to give our zebras to the lions because that's a natural behavior. So this is the difference between the two, you know, that what they can do in the wild, it might not be allowable in captivity. And that's the difference between the two terms. So you just have to make sure that you are eliciting the right behaviors for your animals. Hey, Hilda, so great to get those different definitions. And thank you so much for sharing. Before we move on and get you to share a few of your favorite stories, I wanted to take this opportunity and specifically discuss training with you now. You mentioned to me that you would like to talk about the importance of husbandry training specifically scale training, voluntary injection training, and having animals voluntarily shift. Could you tell the audience a little bit more about your experience here and the importance of this training, especially when it comes to aiding the work that our veterinarians have to do with our animals? Yes, um, mostly in developing zoos, when I am visiting, I realize that the first problem is that the, that the animals don't shift. They won't go outside and they won't come inside when asked. And this is a very important training program that I I encourage all zoos to follow because if you have any kind of emergency, not just something happening in your park or in your institution, but if the animal, for example, gets injured and you can't get it off the exhibit very fast, it could cause the animal's life or health. So that's a very important thing. And, and I think that people should pay a lot of attention to shifting from A to B or the animals. The other one is the scale training. I think every animal that possibly could be trained to step up onto a kale on its own, meaning that you don't have to manhandle it and then put it into a very kennel or any kind of other uh, crates and then weigh it, would uh, decrease the stress enormously from the animal's part, not to mention from the staff part when you don't have to chase an animal all over and capture it one way or another and then uh, weigh it. The first questions, uh, as far as I know, of the veterinarians when there is a problem is how much is your animal weigh? That would give them the information information of whether it's losing weight or gaining weight, or if they have to administer medicine, how much medicine they can give to this animal, if they have to immobilize it, how much medicine they need to use to immobilize it. So I would encourage everybody to pay a lot of attention for skill training in the animal's life. And then um, voluntary injections. Well, of course, again, for an animal, when the veterinarian need to inject it, getting shot and going to anesthetize, it's an extremely stressful situation, not to mention that most of the times they are really keeping their grudges for a long, long time with the veterinarians and the keepers, when the keeper has to assist with uh, capturing the animal and shoot it. So injection training, again, is a fantastic way to reduce the stress of the animal and the better relationship the staff has with the animal, obviously in captivity, the better for everybody. It saves you time, it saves you energy, it saves your staff trying to fix all the problems in a long time as opposed to just the keeper walking up to the animal, asking the animal to come over to the mesh and then you can just inject it and it goes to sleep. These are the things that I notice when I travel around the world and I think people need to pay attention to it more in general, in developing countries mostly. So just really thinking in advance and when you're writing up maybe a training plan for your animal and thinking about the behaviors you want to train, just training some of those basic foundations, like targeting and stationing and all, and recall and, and crating and shifting, all this stuff's going to help decrease stress for the animals and, and maintain those relationships over time. Yes. I mean, a lot of times I heard that, oh, this is a, a wild animal. We don't want to have such a close connection with it. Again, this is just my opinion and 
people might not agree with it, but I think this is a wild species that is held in captivity. The better relationship the staff has with this animal, the better it is for the animal as well. It's less stressful for everybody. And um, it has all kinds of behaviors in captivity that you need to manage. Behavioral management is extremely important. Without it, you can't have a happy and healthy animal and a happy and successful animal management. So, of course, stress reduction and good relationship is extremely important in our business. Couldn't agree more, Hilda. We have two more questions to go. And sure. I absolutely love this part of the podcast. I can't <laughs> wait to hear your answers to the next question. Can you think back now over your great experience so far? And I was wondering if you could share two or three stories from the past 28 years and some of the important lessons you've learned along the way. Well, when we started the contra fielding program, of course, like everybody else, we made mistakes. It was on a trial and error basis, like everybody else's. One of my favorite was when we made a mistake, it started out in the equine area, when we put the horses' uh, pellets into the boomer ball feeders, and that went into the horses' trough. And we watched the horses working their balls, turning it, and trying to get the diet out of it. And we were so proud of ourselves and then two weeks later we had 20 extremely upset horses and the equine manager and I were like where we what happened where we made the mistake what's going on they're frantically rolling their balls they don't seem happy they seem agitated and then we realized that we assume that the horses learned that they don't have enough time to eat all their food because now it's more difficult to get to it like I said before they have to go out out and do their jobs. I don't know, maybe horse, horse hands classes or just pulling a carriage or whatever their daily job is on that day. So we, re <laughs> we, we realized that we weren't that great and immediately changed the program. So then the animals will get free fed diet before they have to go and work. And then when they come back from work, that's when they have to control free road because they have the entire afternoon and uh, up till the next morning when the keeper comes in. So <laughs> There was one error what we made. And then of care, you know, teaching your animals how to control free load, it's uh, sometimes very difficult. You have species that are completely aware of their surroundings and every minor change in there, such as birds. And uh, one of our ideas was that we have this metal dish with their diet hung on the mesh and we just put a brown lunch bag on the top of it, just put it on it and hung it back on and said, okay, now figure it out how to work it. And then the birds wouldn't touch their diet. And we were like, oh boy, that doesn't work <laughs> very well. So we had to rip the lunch bag all the way apart and just lay it out on the dish side uh, in both sides. And that encouraged them a little bit more and they got braver and they started to eat. And then we had to teach them step by step when we tore the lunch bag less and less and less apart until now they you know we just have the full bag obviously and they immediately start to ripping it apart when they see it so it's not very easy to teach your animals for example it was again a long time ago with our mandrels who are extremely intelligent obviously I, we gave them cardboard boxes and they were so scared of it 20 years ago they wouldn't want to touch the cardboard box uh, we had four night houses connecting and whichever night has part was the box that's where the mandrels wouldn't come over so we just kept leaving it there and hoping that sometime it took them almost a week before finally they realized that the cardboard box not going to harm them and it became one of their favorite toys when i remember barbara filling it up with water from the lixit and then climbing up on the top of their cages and running in circles and dumping water that everybody <laughs> and the other mandrels weren't happy by the way but chasing her all over but the point of the story is then I encourage everybody if you give an enrichment item to your animal and it doesn't work don't say well it's a failure I suggest you wait if you have a week or even two weeks depending on the species or the individual animal cognitive skills and try different things modify things 
teach your animal how to work your enrichment item as opposed to just giving up immediately and say, well, okay, we tried, but it didn't work. Hey, fantastic stories, Hilda. Just to build on this a little bit, I'm just wondering when you chuck an enrichment item in, do you have a procedure in place at Phoenix Zoo for measuring the effectiveness of your enrichment item? Of course we do. We have actually several different kind of levels. One is that the keepers log on daily and fill out the, we have a monthly enrichment schedule and on that on daily with what we have done today, who did it and then has to evaluate it on the same day to how the keeper thinks that enrichment went. We can look back, of course, to these logs all the time and identify trends and trying to figure out whether if it's still a good enrichment, shall we modify it, shall we uh, discontinue it or even disapprove it if something happens. That's just the daily logs what we fill out all the time. Time, I sit down with all the managers and the BE reps, the behavioral enrichment representatives. Each um, area has a keeper who is responsible for behavioral enrichment. And I'm working with these keepers uh, close range together in each area to what has to be done. And so we evaluate all the time. But with the manager and the BE rep, we sit down minimum once a year. That's the minimum. It's uh, obviously more than that, but minimum once a year. Also, we do have behavioral observation team. So we have the behavioral observation team who is responsible for animal observations. They are volunteers, highly trained volunteers in our zoo who helps also evaluate enrichment if needed. And then we have studies we conducted. One of our most famous one is our elephant study went um, close to a year and a half. Again, our valuable volunteers standing out in the sun, in the rain, in the wind and collecting data about how much our animals foraging. And uh, we went from well, it was like 10 years ago, but if I'm correct, went from 9.3% average to 37.9% average. And um, it is an average because um, some of the elephants were eating very fast and figuring out the puzzle feeders faster than the others. And so it was just the average of what we wanted to see, but um, it is a high increase in our foraging enrichment. So depending on the program, we can go from a simple daily evaluation to a yearly evaluation all the way to actually designing studies to prove it. I really like that because I'm a bit of a data nerd and I like to... <laughs> <laughs> collect the data about the effectiveness of what we're implementing. Can you just briefly, for everyone listening out there, discuss how important it is to collect this information? Now, of course, it's important. If you don't look into it to what have you improved, how would you know if it's effective whatsoever? You need to know if what you're doing is something that the animal is actually using and how well it's used it or whether you need to change it or not. Gathering data is to prove whether if it's working or not and go from there. You need to know how it works. The animals do get bored with their enrichment after, after a while and then if you just keep writing down that you gave it to them and you're not following up on them, then you will notice that your animal doesn't really use your enrichment. You think it's a good one but two years later, your animal might be completely bored with it and here is the time when you need to modify it or just simply say, well, you know what, uh, maybe I'm going to give it less frequently to the animals so it barks up the interest again, or you will say, no, it's just not working whatsoever. Let me try to find something else that the animal can use. It's no longer good. So at not knowing this, you can keep recording to yourself every day that you give enrichment, but it's not good for the animal. Everybody has to take some extra time to do the paperwork and the observations and all the things that people don't like to do because it's about the animals and you need to do the extra. You need to go out of your way and figuring out what's best for them because you are the eyes and you are the ears of these animals. They can tell you what's wrong. They cannot complain to you. So you have to have like a sixth sense and a lot of observation skills and a lot of, lot of extra input and work to make their lives happy. Great explanation. I really enjoyed that. 
and just before we move on to that last question, because we we're going to talk about this earlier in the podcast, and this kind of fits in quite well here, and that's about if your instrument's not working and you go back to the drawing board, something that might help you is to think about all the different types of enrichment you can offer. And I know you mentioned to me earlier that there's kind of six types of enrichment that you like to think about, and you kind of have a little bit of a ranking system for them. Can you go over this for us? Yeah. The Phoenix Zoo, it's not necessary every institution. It's just the Phoenix Zoo recognizes um, within our institution six types of enrichment. Foraging, substrate, social enrichment, training, manipulanda, and the five senses. To rank them, I think the most important one is the social enrichment. That's just my opinion. I truly believe that for all social animals, what the first thing someone has to do is to figure out whether it's that animal being kept in the right social circumstances. That's extremely important. For example, it doesn't matter if you put two primates together into a cardboard box or into a crystal palace. If they like each other, they will be really satisfied and happy. Well, that's an anthropomorphic term, but um, they will exhibit all the species appropriate behaviors that needed in captivity, let's put it this way. And if you keep that primate in solitary confinement, you can give all the enrichment you possibly want to, still will be lonely and will not be able to exhibit all the behaviors you want, all the happy and healthy behaviors from your animals. It's very important. So unless it's a solitary by nature, the first thing I look when I go around in a zoo is whether all the species that's supposed to be are kept in the right social groups. That's for me the most important thing. Then I look at foraging, which is very important to me, which is almost tied together with the substrate enrichment, like I explained before, because you can make foraging uh, much more useful and, and easier if you just use substrate. And if a zoo doesn't have much resources, that's the easiest way to do. But foraging enrichment, I would say, may become second to me because, like I said, this is the most frequently find species typical behavior in the wild. Every animal spends most of their time searching for food and somehow get to their food, like we said. And I think it's fairly well tied with substrate and the edible browse, which is also foraging item. It's a lot of people don't realize that animals, if you just cut down some fresh leafy branches, they forage on it much longer than they would on their diet. I'm not quite sure why is that, but it takes mostly over an hour or for some animals several hours and for some animals several days to clear out some browse and eat it. And it is the veterinarian's best friends, or at least that's what they told me, because it has low calories, so it doesn't really change the animal's weight. It's full of minerals and vitamins and fiber. And so substituting some food with edible browse it's a fantastic enrichment for most of the animals. And those who doesn't forage on it, it, it can provide fantastic hiding places, uh, visual barriers, play, you know, toys, things like that. So browse is a very good thing also to use. So I would say social foraging substrate, of course, training, because uh, reducing stress is extremely important in captivity. And then the manipulanda, I didn't come up with that word. People keep laughing at me. It's actually a term from USD. DA, manipulanda, is the manipulative items that the animals can just play with, but it's not something edible. And of course, the five senses. So these are the six categories that we recognize and try to enrich on a daily basis in the zoo. As a matter of fact, in our zoo, what we try to do for most of the animals is that they need to receive at least one contrafielding and one non-food related enrichment item daily. And then, of course, depending on the animal's cognitive level, such as, you know, great tapes or primates in general, elephants, high inter highly intelligent birds and reptiles, they can go as far as six, seven types of enrichment a day. <laughs> I would absolutely love to come spend a day, a week, a year at Phoenix Zoo and just hang out with your keepers and, and look at the enrichment catalogs and logs and what you guys are doing. It just sounds fantastic. And I don't know what makes me laugh more. The mandrels pouring <laughs> buckets or boxes of water over each other or imagining chimpanzees living in crystal palaces. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> 
<laughs> but it's true and it's true for human too i think people don't think it over you know that a human as a primate and a social species when you are alone when you have nobody waiting for you at home and you are not in love and you go home to an empty house i am wondering myself how much difference does it make to you whether you have a two-story building and the highest technology and your color tv and your iphone and your whatnot but at point you're still going home alone so the other type of enrichment doesn't matter that much does it so social enrichment again comes first and this is completely in my humble opinion true for all social animals it's it's a price it's a great philosophy it kind of is similar to the saying money doesn't buy you happiness <laughs> All your color TVs and your two-story houses and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. You want to be social. You need to be around of humans and you need to be loved and love someone and be busy with your own kind. Just ha going home to an empty house cannot make you happy. I like it. Hey, thanks so much for sharing that, all how do We are sadly nearly at the end of the podcast. But just before we finish, I'm really excited to ask you one more question. And that has to do with your role in the Jane Goodall Institute. Can you tell us how you got involved with this what being a mentor means and also about this exciting new movie you have coming out for the institute well when i did the contra flooding program a reporter made an article about it in the AAA magazine and apparently the director of the chimpanzee back then dr virginia alondo read it so i received an email from her saying if she could talk to me because she finally after all this year find somebody who shares her opinion of what enrichment should be in theory and so she came up to phoenix from um, tucson and we talked about four hours and she asked me if i I would be a mentor for the Jane Goodall Institute. That was in 2007. So at that point, my job was to mainly via Skype and email, help other zoos with their questions. So I was helping with the enrichment programs and training programs and behavioral issues if they had basically anything what they threw at me, I tried to find the answer for it. And then in about 2012, the Phoenix Zoo decided that they will try to merge my job and the Jane Goodall Institute's job together uh, since I'm doing the similar things for both institutions and created the International Animal Welfare Coordinator position. So although before my position, I did take care of other animals as well. Obviously, when I went to another zoo putting chimpanzees together, when people came to me asking me about lions or tigers and other species and to what they can do, I naturally went around and I looked at every exhibit and tried to do my best to give advice. But now it's um, even more official because now I'm not just going officially out just to take care of chimpanzees. I am looking at all animals from butterflies to elephants practically to what can I do. And then, you know, of course, I'm just a human being and I don't have the answer for everything. So if I don't know the answer, I will put the zoo in contact with our managers and other managers around the word if that's necessary and they can take it from there i don't like to pretend that i know things i think it's not a smart thing to do people always recognize it anyway if not tomorrow and not five days later then maybe five years later that you were just pretending so i have no problem saying i have no idea uh, what the answer is but i will find it for you and I guess in the past decade, zoos started to get used to it because they asking more and more questions, even if it's not primate related and asking me if, if I would help them. And so it's a fantastic job. I'm absolutely in love with it because uh, my job is now purely animal welfare and to help all the animals who can't help themselves. And I can't imagine to do anything else but this. <laughs> and, you know, if you think it over that the Phoenix Zoo doesn't even have chimpanzees and how much they are supporting this program. So it's fantastic. This is the Phoenix Zoo and in my opinion is the best fantastic and maybe just dive a little bit deeper there and tell us about this new movie that's coming out oh <laughs> oh the movie so chloe rossman a movie director is following me around in a couple of countries where i'm going and actually documenting my job how am i doing what am i doing when i get to a zoo how am i uh, evaluating uh, how am i interacting with the staff what kind of changes i make how am i putting the chimpanzees together 
um, and all the other changes. And it's extremely important because up till today, many, many zoos keeping their animals, how, how should I say it, um, a bit below standards. And it's extremely important to bring awareness to how animals are being kept. But on the other hand, it's even more important to show the world that it doesn't matter if you have no resources, if you have no money, if you have no people, and uh, you are a very poor zoo, and you think that there is nothing you can do any better because uh, you lack everything what all the richer zoos have. It's not entirely true because if you are inventive and creative, you can make a lot of changes from nothing. And I think this became my specialty is to how to make mince pie from nothing, as I'm joking with it all the time. You know, I have practically nothing, but I figured out what can I do with it and then we go from there and it's a fantastic way to change the animals lives and I love it when I see the people's faces watching their animals being happy I have seen so many directors and keepers cry of happiness watching and they said they never knew it can be done or what could be done and how much better they are so I think it's very important to, to show this to the world that they don't have to be hopeless and helpless when they want to improve animal welfare. Hey, that sounds really exciting, Hilda. And I'm really happy for you because it sounds like you've found amazing happiness in your own life and you're doing what you love and you're making a huge difference. So I'm excited for you and I'm excited to see this movie. And I know that you said that there's a trailer out for it. Yes. You've sent that to me in an email. So I'll just include that in the podcast write up for everyone to view if that's okay with you. Okay. Sounds wonderful. Perfect. Hey, I hope that you out there enjoyed listening to this podcast as much as we enjoyed making it. Hilda, this has been so much fun. From myself and everyone listening, a massive, massive thank you for being on the show today. And again, thank you so much for having me because it doesn't matter what kind of advice I give. If people don't take it, then it doesn't matter. So thank you so much for listening to me. Hey, the pleasure is all ours, Hilda. What a fantastic episode and so many great little lessons, stories and takeaway messages from the episode today. I can't wait to go back through and listen to this all over during the week when I do the editing. And if you listening out there haven't heard the other episodes yet, then please make sure to go check them out. You can find them all at www.animaltrainingacademy.com or on iTunes or just search for Animal Training Academy on the podcast app from your smart device and you'll be able to find all the episodes there. And then you can listen to them on your way to work or whilst you're mowing the lawns doing the dishes or wherever else you may find yourself also i would love to hear from you so please leave a comment on the website tell me what you thought of this episode if you liked it if you didn't like it what you want to learn more about who you want to hear on the show and especially about any animal training and slash or behavioral challenges you might be having there are loads of extra resources available from animal training academy over and above these podcasts so just shoot me a message and we'll make sure we get you the information you need the easiest way to do that is to head over to www.animaltrainingacademy.com and scroll down to the bottom of the page where you'll find the contact tab hit that and you'll be able to send a personal message direct to my inbox i absolutely love hearing from you guys that's it from this episode though once again thank you so much for listening and you'll be hearing from me again soon cheerio mm-hmm.